Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be able to talk to you today about the Indian Church Village Craft Training Project and the resulting artisans group, people in a project close to my heart. For those who don't know, Indian Church Village is adjacent to the Lamini site. Because of the craft training project and getting to know people in the village, we also started a village library and a high school scholarship program. In the next presentation, Laura Howard will touch on the development of the library. Then Rutilia Yuseda and Marvin Ruano will talk about the high school scholarship program. First, some background. In 1998, I attended a Maya architecture field school at Lamini, taught by Drs. David Pendergast and Liz Graham. I'd taken Maya and Mesoamerican art history courses, but wanted to know how that art was uncovered by archaeologists. That summer, I fell in love with Lamini, archaeology, and the local people. At the time, I was a studio artist working in metals, primarily copper. Anxious to return to Lamini in 1999, I assisted Dr. Scott Simmons on the Maya metallurgy project, investigating copper production. What better way to combine my knowledge of copper working with archaeology? While working with Scott that summer, I started getting to know people in the village. Most of the families had come as refugees from Guatemala and different parts of Central America. The village was small, rural, and remote, with few economic opportunities. Belize buses only served the village two days a week, when the roads weren't too muddy, it was a two hour ride to Orange Walk Town. Village houses were very basic, few had indoor plumbing, and there was no electricity in the village. There still isn't. People didn't have cell phones then. There was one village telephone at someone's house. Certainly no computers in the village. Las Arcadias restaurant was just getting started. There was a primary school, but the teachers didn't always show up. I was saddened to learn how little money the villagers earned for their hard labor and I wished that I could do something to help them. That summer, Liz Bram, the director of Lamb and I, and I started kicking around ideas for craft training for the villagers. I was lucky to have the opportunity to get involved with this when in 2000, Liz Graham was awarded a grant from Canada Fund for Local Initiatives, CFLI. The goal was integrating some of the local villagers with archaeology activities at Lamini, such as pottery reconstruction, artifact re reproductions, and other lab and site museum needs, as well as teaching them about the site and cultural heritage. That summer, a group of archaeologists, artists, and architects working at the Lamini site, the team, as I shall refer to them, began this endeavor. The CFLI funds allowed us to conduct free craft training sessions for anyone in Indian Church interested in learning some craft skills. These sessions were held weekly in the Village Community Center. There was lots of enthusiasm among the villagers with around 50 people participating. Simultaneously, the Belize Tourism Development Project, TDP, was just starting at Lamini with reconstruction of some of the structures so there were many archaeologists and team members living in the village from 2000 through 2003. This helped the momentum of the Artisans Training Project because we were able to maintain regular weekend craft day teaching sessions. Tourists staying at the nearby Lamini Outpost Lodge loved interacting with villagers. The team helped the emerging artisans sell their crafts to tourists who visited the village. Villagers began to see the possibility of making an income from their craft making. Recently, some of the former scholarship students told me that the income they got from the sale of their pieces helped with their high school expenses. We saw so much potential for the villagers being integrated into Lamini site activities, where they could benefit financially from increased tourism at the site. And by learning about Lamini, we encouraged them to be stakeholders of the site. After a year of the weekend craft sessions, we decided to offer a two-week adult-only intensive jewelry making workshop in June 2001, mainly because I was a metalsmith artist and I volunteered to teach it. Supplies were purchased from the CFLI grant. 
I remember Laura Howard and I going from house to house in the village to tell people about it and explain they would need to pay a $20 Belize fee to help with the supply cost. We had 10 students sign up. Most of them paid $50 Belize to keep their basic jewelry toolkit. After the workshop, the village clinic was used as a jewelry studio. All the equipment from the workshop was kept there and workshop attendees had access. Let me say here that none of the team members were ever paid for their time on the craft project. It was completely voluntary. We didn't make any money on this. In April 2002, with numerous local villagers enthusiastically embracing the project, Liz Graham, who lived in London, England, applied for funds from the British High Commission in Belize to construct an artisan center building. The funding was awarded soon thereafter. Claude Polanche and I designed the building, which incorporated FEMA and Belize building standards for hurricane shelters. With additional funds from the government of Belize, I spent months pleading with them, and the donated labor of local villagers and others, a 1600 square foot artisan center hurricane shelter was constructed under Claude's direction. We all worked together in mixing concrete, pouring foundations, and picking paint colors. In November 2002, we had an opening ceremony for the building. The British High Commissioner cut the ribbon. There was music, dancing, and feasting for all. We got another BHC grant for furniture and completed the interior of the building in early 2003. Soon the artisans were working in their new studios for jewelry making, needleworking, stone carving, and ceramics. With a design motif book that we had created for them, they produced uh, designs referencing lamini motifs, Maya art, and local flora and fauna, and sold their pieces in a small gift shop in the building. With the new building, excitement among the many artisans was still high. The jewelry metalworking group of about 10 people took the lead since they were the first to form as a group. The artisans registered as an official community-based organization. Officers were elected and bylaws were drawn up. We applied for grants for teaching and equipment because there was so much more for the artisans to learn. Little did I know then how complicated and time-consuming the grant process would become. Later in 2003, the ICVA also got their own gift shop at Lamini. When it first opened, the artisans sold only the crafts that they produced. They later started buying things to sell, creating some problems in the group. But business was good with sales close to $10,000 please dollars some months, all of it going directly to the artisans. Tourism at Lamini steadily increased in the 2000s. Incidentally, in 2015, Lamini was getting about 60,000 tourists a year. There was such potential for the artisans to make money. After the artisans were settled in their new studios, the real work began. Many of the villagers initially involved in the artisans project were in a generation of adults who either had no formal education or just a couple of years of primary school. One day, the sewing group asked me to teach them how to make different colors with fabric paint. I was, naively, shocked because this seemed like such basic knowledge, but then it dawned on me that they had never been taught that blue and yellow make green. I also learned some didn't know how to use a ruler and many had never used a bank additional training was definitely needed. The project carried on largely through the help of volunteers and donations. Louise Belange applied for a British Executive Services Overseas volunteer to teach crafts for several months. As the Artisan Center was being prepared to open in February 2003, Bissot's Sue Lowe arrived to teach crafts. Canadian Mark Pope came then too for three months month internship, helping finish up the interior of the building and working with the artisans. We were lucky to have Sue return again in 2004. We also applied for a Peace Corps volunteer to work with the artisans group, and later in 2003, we got the first of several Peace Corps volunteers, and I became a Peace Corps volunteer supervisor. Unfortunately, the first volunteer didn't work out. With the artisans still in need of skills training, 
no grant funds on the horizon, and the TDP project winding down in late 2003 with team members leaving, we needed volunteers to teach. I was committed to this project and I continued voluntarily directing it for years. Laura Howard also continued with village projects and we both spent time in the village every year. As a craftsperson myself, I gave many quick lessons, taught some week long workshops and helped with business and marketing. We convinced about 20 artists from abroad to teach a variety of craft workshops. I also continued to apply for funding for craft and business training and to solicit donations for supplies and equipment. We aim to teach things that would help the Indian Church Village artisans run their own local cottage industry, producing quality crafts to market to the numerous tourists who visit Lamanai and Belize each year. We taught the artisans about the Maya, Belize history and local culture. We took them around Belize to market their products to gift shops. So many things. I was relentless in seeking funding. In January 2003, I participated with the Orange Walk Rotary Club at the project fair in Belize City. We were aiming to get an international club to partner with them for the Artisans Project. After making some presentations in my community in Colorado, a partnership was formed and a grant was awarded to the artisans. We also got a grant for the artisans from the Belize Social Investment Fund, Basic Needs Trust Fund. To, these two grants took a very long time to implement, but they eventually paid for some tools and supplies, a solar power system for the artisan center, a computer miscellaneous office equipment, and for several craft, business, and computer classes. It all sounds great, right? But there was trouble on the horizon. Unfortunately, the grants for the artisans from Rotary and SIF took months, then many years to implement, and the project lost a lot of momentum in the meantime. Although well intended, the donor agencies, project requirements, and inflexible rules were daunting. Time ticked away, excitement faded. Some of the artisans began to lose interest because of a disconnect between their local needs and donor priorities. The artisans were getting lots of stuff for free, but very little training was provided. And the artisans received stuff they didn't know what to do with. And receiving all this free stuff meant they didn't understand its value. The artisans were not equipped with skills to reinvest money, manage accounts, and pay bills. Maintenance was also a problem. They weren't trained to maintain things. One day, Ricardo, the president of the artisans group, asked me why there was no power from the solar system. No one told them that the batteries for the system had to be kept filled with water. Initially, the artisans marketed their crafts to gift shops throughout Belize, but this was challenging because of the remoteness of the village and the difficulty communicating and traveling. There were no cell phones then. There was also mistrust among the members when it came to handling money and their financial dealings. Teaching results were varied as some volunteers were too inexperienced to understand and meet the needs of the artisans. Obtaining art supplies locally became a problem. Not surprisingly, there were a couple of exceptional artisans, but poor quality workmanship was a consistent problem for some of the artisans who seemed unable to understand the importance of quality standards. The artisans group fractured and individuals competed for ownership of the things they'd been given. Many quit. There was a lack of strong leadership within the group and members didn't understand each other. Many found it difficult to work as a group. Not everyone agreed to reinvest a portion of their earnings for maintenance and other things. By 2008, the disagreement between the members of the artisans group was out of hand. I tried to be neutral through all the problems with the artisans, seeking to understand everyone's viewpoint, but I was unable to resolve their conflicts. Today, a couple of artisans make crafts in their homes. The artisan center with its faded paint is typically locked and no tourists visit. Two people sometimes make jewelry in the artisan center where the 20,000 Belize dollar solar power system sits broken. The lack of electricity is cited as a prime reason that the artisans don't work there. It seems the artisans couldn't find any way to invest 
in new batteries and repair their solar power system. Incidentally, the Artisan Center is used by the villagers as a hurricane shelter when needed. About eight of the former artisans still run the gift shop at Lamini, but almost everything sold in the shop is bought in Blue City and Maltor and resold in the gift shop. People involved in non-governmental organizations, faith-based missions, and volunteer initiatives, myself included, have good intentions, but through this project, I've changed my thinking. Now I am more critical of development projects and giving stuff for free. Participants must be invested in the project. Training is vital. Projects have unexpected complexities. How do we help without creating dependency? We need to find a better balance. Thanks for attending, and thank you to a multitude of people who helped with the project.